Good morning, everybody. If you would please go ahead and open up your Bible to Acts chapter 15, and I'll join you there in just a moment. If you're visiting with us, two things. I hope that you've been greeted. I hope that you feel welcome. We're glad that you're here. And uh, we have been in a sermon series now since the beginning of the year, studying through the book of Acts, going nearly verse by verse. And today we are uh, in Acts chapter 15, and we're going to wrap up Acts chapter 15 by just studying these few verses, 36 through 41. The title of this morning's sermon is actually like a continuation from last Sunday's sermon. We're talking about disagreements. And today the, top, uh, the title is Dealing with Disagreements, Part 2. And if you were here last week, then you'll remember how the first half of Acts chapter 15 talks about a disagreement that they had in the church. And if you've ever been a part of a disagreeing, a disagreeing church, you know it's not fun. But there is a biblical blueprint that is to be looked at and to be followed as we're dealing with disagreements that happen within the church. Well, that was last week. This week, you're going to see once again just how practical God's Word is. This week, we're going to study what happens when you have a disagreement with an individual. Not the church collectively as a whole, but an individual, maybe a friend, co-worker, a fellow staff member of a church, uh, whatever the case may be, dealing with a disagreement on an individual level. So let me set the stage for you and remind you of what's happened. Paul and Barnabas are two friends who were serving at the church over here in Antioch, and they decided, uh, because they were being led by the Holy Spirit, to go on a missions trip. And so they were being supported by the church in Antioch as they went on this missions trip and really converted all these people who had never heard about who Jesus was. And so they went on this missions trip for the sole purpose of getting Gentiles converted and trying to get them to follow Jesus as well as some Jews there too. Well, as you remember, they arrived back in Antioch and scholars aren't really sure how long this missions trip lasted. There's indicators that it could have lasted anywhere from as long, as little as five months up to a year. But they've been traveling together, and so Paul and Barnabas know each other really well. They've been working together for a long time. They're friends. They're ministry partners. And what's going to happen, as we're going to see here in Acts chapter 15, is these two, Paul and Barnabas, are going to have a disagreement and we're going to learn from them. So follow along as I read, starting in verse 36. It reads, After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brethren in every city in which we proclaim the word of the Lord, and, and just see how they're doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul kept insisting that they should not take him along, who had deserted them in Pamphylia, and had not gone with them to the work. And there occurred such a sharp disagreement that Paul and Barnabas separated from one another. And Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left, being committed by the brethren to the grace of the Lord. And he was traveling through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. There it is, a disagreement between friends. And it's interesting, those verses don't give, go into great detail about what happened with the disagreement. We're going to talk a little bit about that today. But this is where I want to start this morning. I want you to understand that life is messy. Life's messy. Can we all agree on that? It's difficult and there's a lot of troubles that we each will face. But the trouble that we're talking about today is how to deal with disagreements between friends. Our text this morning is a reminder that relationships are extremely complicated. Maintaining peace and unity with all the relationships that exist in your life is a full-time job. Amen? You've got family relationships you're trying to maintain peace and unity. You've got work relationships you're trying to maintain peace and unity. You have church relationships that you're trying to maintain peace and unity. It's a full-time job trying to keep the peace. And this is what you need to understand. Disagreements will happen. And all of those areas I just mentioned, there will come 
times when you disagree with somebody in each of those social circles. I can remember coming to Burnside Christian Church as a young and somewhat naive and definitely inexperienced minister. I was working with Chris Reynolds at the time. Uh, he was the preaching minister. I was the youth minister. It was my first experience working in a church with another staff member. And I worked with Chris for seven years. And I'm not exaggerating when I tell you that we never had a disagreement. The only time we had a disagreement was maybe when we were over at Mike Bavery's playing the game of risk and he was trying to evict my soldiers out of Asia, you know, that I was fortifying there. That may have been the only time we've ever had any ounce of a disagreement. And if you know Chris Reynolds, then you won't find that statement hard to believe. Chris spoiled me. He was so easy to get along with. We had very, very fruitful years of ministry together. But through the course of my ministry here at Burnside, I've worked with several different staff members throughout the years and several different elders throughout the years, and there were disagreements that have happened. And while it used to be beyond the scope of my imagination that there could ever be a problem between uh, two godly individuals who are working together for the same purpose, I have been doing ministry long enough to know that you can't work together closely in proximity over a lengthy period of time without having an honest relationship where there's going to be some disagreements. And in our text, you're going to notice that it was a sharp disagreement between friends. Both of these men, both Paul and Barnabas, were God-honoring Christ followers. They were ministry leaders. They were friends, but separation came in and divided them. Has that ever happened to you? Maybe you lost some friends. Uh, maybe you no longer speak to somebody because of a sharp disagreement that happened. Words were spoken. Things were done. And it created this division between you and this other person. If that's happened to you, hang in there. Because I believe the Bible has something to say to you today. Can I just be 100% transparent and real? And it's something that, you know, we haven't really addressed in, in any kind of detail, and we're not going to take time to address it in detail this morning. But you need to be aware. Uh, during the course of my ministry here at Burnside, there have been sharp disagreements with people over two main issues since I've been at Burnside. Both disagreements were ones in which I lost close friends. Both disagreements called, caused separation and division. Both disagreements caused distraction and hurt deeply. Those two disagreements, one happened when we hired a female children's minister. And the second sharp disagreement that I had in, uh, in this church is the handling of COVID. Now what I've come to learn and what I believe the Bible speaks to in great detail is this. It's okay to disagree. It's going to happen. But while it's okay to disagree, don't become disagreeable. That's when unity gets threatened. That's when division enters in. That's when splits occur. The key is to, be, to have a disagreement without becoming disagreeable. And I'm convinced that if you were to ask Paul and Barnabas about their disagreement, their sharp disagreement, I believe these two uh, would tell you that it was not solved in a way that uh, they either one wish would have, would have happened the way that it did. So what's the difference between disagreeing about something and being disagreeable? Disagreeable means being unfriendly or bad-tempered. You see, in the midst of disagreement, don't become disagreeable. And I've personally witnessed disagreements morph a person who became disagreeable. And I'm sad to tell you that I haven't always handled disagreements well either. And that I have sometimes been disagreeable in the midst of disagreement. When a person becomes disagreeable, reconciliation is nearly impossible. You ever experienced that? That when you might disagree about something, but when it escalates and it becomes now a personal thing, 
Reconciliation is nearly impossible because everything that comes out of the mouth of the person that you are disagreeable towards, where you have anger and unfriendliness aimed, will be met by you with cynicism. You may not know what cynicism is, but I guarantee you've experienced it when you've been offended and you've dealt with somebody who now you're disagreeable with. Because everything that they say is met with an eye roll or a sigh or a scoff or a head shake. And so please, 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 if you have a disagreement with someone, check your heart. Make sure you don't let the disagreement turn you into a person who is now disagreeable. Make sure that you don't become bitter and don't let your emotions get the best of you. Make sure that you remember the person that you disagree with is someone that Jesus Christ died for. Good advice even for me. Disagreements will happen. And when they do, remember it's okay to disagree, but don't be disagreeable. Well, what happens in our text? Paul and Barnabas, these two friends who work so close, side by side. And it's interesting that after the disagreement we just read about in Acts chapter 15, we never read of them working together ever again. So what happened? Well, it depends on who you ask. And that's the second thing I want you to make note of. In every disagreement, there are two sides. I mean, that's kind of the definition of a disagreement. One issue, one situation, two points of view, two perspectives, two sides. And I want to look at the disagreement through the eyes of the parties involved. And I want to go back and I want to read verses 36 through 38. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brethren in every city in which we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Barnabas wanted to take John, called Mark, along with him also. But Paul kept insisting that they should not take John Mark along with them, who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Now, one thing you may have missed it, I want you to pay close attention to it because it's vitally important. This disagreement started out with two of them agreeing. Did you see it there in verse 36? Paul has this idea, hey, we should go back and revisit all the people that we've converted for Christ. And Barnabas is like, hey, that's a great idea. I think we should do that. They started out agreeing. Where did the disagreement come? with how that should take place. They agreed on the mission. They agreed fundamentally that this is a good idea. What they disagreed on was how it should be done. Barnabas wanted to take John Mark with them. Paul was like, no, 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 no. That's a terrible idea. And that is where the disagreement took place. If you remember, back in the book of Acts, uh, chapter 13... Paul and Barnabas were getting ready to depart on their first missions trip because this is some history that you need to know. There's some history, there's some water that's passed underneath the bridge and that you need to be aware of. In Acts chapter 13, verses 4 and 5, we're told this. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, Paul and Barnabas went to Seleucia and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they reached Salamis, they began to proclaim the word of God in the synagogues to the Jews. And what's it say? And they had also John as their helper. You see, John Mark was selected by Paul and Barnabas to be their helper on their first missionary journey. He wasn't a spokesman. He was a bag handler. He was an assistant. Whatever needed to be done, he was the errand boy, he was the gopher, he was the guy who was helping Paul and Barnabas. Interesting information you need to know. John Mark was a Jewish convert who lived in Jerusalem. This is also the same John Mark who would eventually go on to write the Gospel of Mark. He's the guy that they went with Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey. But on that trip, something happened. To Luke's credit, he doesn't go into great detail. How many of you, if you were writing the events, would... Take a little time and describe exactly what happened. Here's the juicy details, right? 
All Luke says in Luke chapter, Acts chapter 13, verse 13 is, Now Paul and his companions put out to sea from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia, but John Mark left them and returned home. End of explanation. We're not told why John Mark left and went home. And how many of us believe that if God wanted us to know why John Mark left and returned back to Jerusalem, that he would have told us? But he didn't tell us. All we are told is that John Mark left and returned to Jerusalem. And from that one singular event are born two perspectives. Paul's perspective, Barnabas's perspective. So let's look at this situation first from the perspective of Barnabas. Barnabas is the one who suggests that they take John Mark with them on the second trip. And Bonab something you need to also know, Barnabas and John Mark are cousins. We learn that from Colossians chapter 4, verse 10. They're related. So no doubt, that perhaps makes Barnabas a little more compassionate, a little more biased for John Mark's situation in Acts chapter 13. But remember, who's Barnabas? He is by his very nature an encourager. In fact, Barnabas, that's his nickname. His real name is Joseph, but he was such an encouragement to everybody that he came into contact with that he's known as Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. Maybe he was known as an encourager because he was always willing to help anybody who had need. Or he was willing to do whatever was needed in the church. And that was often encouraging to, ever, to those around him. Barnabas saw the good in people. And he saw the good in John Mark when Paul couldn't. That reminds me, and we need to talk about this. Do you remember how Paul was converted? How did Paul come to Jesus? If you remember, he was a Pharisee who was on his way to arrest and kill anybody who dared follow Jesus. He thought that everybody who followed Jesus was a heretic. And Paul was on the road to Damascus when Jesus intervened in his life, when Jesus shows up on the scene. And through a series of complicated events, eventually Paul is baptized and converted to follow Jesus. And some people were skeptical of Paul's conversion. They, they were hesitant to get too close to Paul because they thought that he was faking it just to get into church circles and hunt down more Christians. And do you remember what happened in that situation? In Acts chapter 9, verses 26 and 27, it was none other than Barnabas who defended Paul and convinced the Christians and the other Jews to give Paul a second chance. Let me read it for you. Verse 26, when Paul came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. Verse 27, but Barnabas took hold of Paul and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road to Damascus and that Jesus had talked to Paul and how at Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. You see, it was Barnabas who gave Paul a second chance when nobody else thought he deserved it. And so Barnabas is having trouble wrapping his mind around the fact why Paul would be so reluctant to give John Mark a second chance. Did you forget? Nobody wanted to give you a second chance either, Paul, but I stepped in and I did that. Can't you just trust me on this one? Can't we just give John Mark a second chance? You see, from Barnabas' perspective, everyone deserves a second chance. And while Paul might have agreed with Barnabas on the decision to forgive John Mark for abandoning them, Paul didn't agree with that John Mark should be allowed to join them on the second missionary trip. And that brings us now to Paul's perspective. Paul's perspective is, hey, there's no room for quitters. Jesus calls us to be faithful to Him. Jesus wants us to be sold out, committed to Him, doesn't want anything to become between us and what we've been called to do. His point of view was that John Mark is a quitter. Verse 28 kind of makes that pretty plain. But Paul kept insisting that they should not take him along 
who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. You see, when the going got tough, John Mark got going all right back home to Jerusalem. And you can tell from Paul's wording how he felt about John Mark. He felt deserted by John, abandoned. He felt as though he was left high and dry in his greatest moment of need. Have you ever felt that way? Someone didn't come through for you the way that you expected them to or the way they said they would? You see, from Paul's perspective, perhaps Paul explained to Barnabas that when they needed him the most, Barnabas left during the toughest days of that first missions trip. You see, John Mark left before Paul and Barnabas ever got to Iconium and Lystra. Remember what happened in Iconium and Lystra? Paul was stoned to death. Where's John Mark? He said he was going to be our helper. He's nowhere to be found. Paul might have even told Barnabas, it doesn't matter why John Mark quit us. The point is, he quit. And I've seen guys like that before, Barnabas. They don't change that quickly or easily. He might have even tossed in a verse of Scripture for good measure. That always helps in a disagreement, right? Take a verse of Scripture that supports your side. And so maybe Paul quoted from Proverbs 25, 19. Confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a broken tooth or a foot out of joint. That's Paul's perspective. But the verse in our text that I've pondered over more than any other this past week is found in verse 39. And there occurred such a sharp disagreement that they separated one from another and Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. The quarrel described as a sharp disagreement indicates that at some point it got heated. The subject of John Mark was an irritant for both of them. Couldn't talk about it. And Barnabas kept wanting to bring it up. And the word translated as sharp disagreement is used to describe a conversation filled with anger, frustration, exasperation, and irritation in a disagreement. I like this. Somebody has creatively suggested how the conversation might have gone between Paul and Barnabas regarding John Mark. Paul, John Mark? Are you kidding? We can't take him. He failed on us last time, Barnabas. But that was last time. Well, he's likely to fail us again. He's a deserter. Well, he's had time to think it over. We can give him another chance. He has the makings of a great missionary. Tell me, Barnabas, isn't it because he's your cousin that you want to take him along? And that's not fair, Barnabas says. You know I've tried to help many people who aren't related to me. I'm convinced that this young man will be a great evangelist one day. Paul. Uh, well, well, we need someone who can stand up against persecutions, an angry mob, beatings, perhaps even jail. Our team has been close-knit. We were a great combination. We are reliable. How can we trust a lad who's failed us like John Mark has? No, Barnabas. Remember the words of the Master? No man who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of heaven. Barnabas. I've talked to him about his failure. I'm sure he won't defect again. To refuse him to go on this trip with us at the moment that he has repented might do some spiritual damage to him. Paul. It's too soon to trust him. Barnabas. Paul, you do remember your conversion, don't you? I took a chance with you. The apostles were afraid of you, thinking that you were faking your conversion in order to infiltrate the church. I didn't make you prove yourself to me first. I vouched for John Mark the same as I vouched for you. Perhaps that's how the conversation went. But what I want you to see about this disagreement is this. Neither side was completely 100% right, and neither side was 100% completely wrong. I mean, even as we've detailed maybe their perspectives, you find yourself wanting to take sides. Are you on Paul's side or are you on Barnabas' side? 
Because nobody can find fault with Barnabas for giving John Mark a second chance. Where would we be if not but for the grace of God who has given us second and third and fourth and repeated chances? But certainly not all of us can blame Paul either for not wanting to risk the possible disaster of taking John Mark along with him. This is a disagreement where there is no right or no wrong solution. So what would you do? If you had this disagreement, would you fight to take John Mark with you or would you insist that he be left behind? What are you to do when you have a sharp disagreement with somebody who is your brother or your sister in Christ? Well, that's where we're going to live in the remaining portion of our sermon today. We're going to talk through the application, some things that we can learn about how to handle disagreements between friends. Because I believe there are three lessons to be learned from what we've just read. Here's the first, and you're not going to like it. You okay with that? God reserves the right to use people that I disagree with. God reserves the right to use the people that I disagree with. Man, that's good advice. That's a good reminder. That's something that we all need to hear in a heated argument where you've got some convictions about a certain thing. We can feel as though we have the right answer and anybody who disagrees with us is just flat out wrong, right? And so when God blesses and uses the person with whom I had a sharp disagreement, well, how could God do that to me? Well, that's because God sees what you don't see. In fact, later on at the end of his life, Paul comes around and recognizes that John Mark is useful to God's kingdom after all. At the end of his final letter to Timothy, in the final chapter, among the final words that Paul ever records on this earth, Paul says to Timothy, only Luke is with me. Pick up John Mark and bring him with you, for he's useful to me for service. You see, Paul finally sees what God saw all along. John Mark is useful to me for service. Here's the second lesson that I think we learn. When both sides have good support, seek a wise compromise. Be willing to bend. Be willing to give and to take. Could Paul or Barnabas or both have developed a reasonable compromise to the situation concerning John Mark? Giving in would not mean heresy. There was no doctrine involved here. It was a matter of preference. Could Paul have said, all right, look, we will tell John Mark that he's on probation with us. We'll allow him to come. But if he doesn't work out within the first month, if I have any inkling that he is not 100% committed to this mission strip, we're going to send him home. Compromise. Or Barnabas could have conceded, you're right, we do need dedicated workers on this team, but let's give John Mark a minor assignment. Let's, let's put his dedication to the test and see how he does. In the meantime, we'll start our journey, and if we hear that he's measuring up, then we will send for him. And if he comes to us, then we'll know that he's dedicated and wants to be on this trip with us. Couldn't they have met in the middle Somewhere along the way. Looking back, they say hindsight's 20 20. Man, that is so true. Looking back on the two major disagreements that I have faced here while at Burnside, I wish we would have compromised a little. I wished both sides would have been able to give just a little. There was no right or wrong solution to the disagreement. Learning to compromise is key if you want any relationship, any relationship to survive, let alone thrive. Don't be quick to draw a line in the sand when there's no need for a line to be drawn. Don't die on every hill that you set out to take. The final lesson that I want you to learn from our text is this, but I'm careful with giving you this lesson because I'm afraid that some of you will use this point 
to rally your cause for every disagreement you have. So I am hesitant to give you this one. But the lesson that I think we learned from our text is this, that God can even use disagreements to grow His kingdom. I want you to see that while God prefers unity and peace among His kids, that disagreements and separation are not beyond the scope of God's ability to use them for His purpose and His glory. How many missions teams did we have before the end of Acts chapter 15? How many missions teams? One. How many missions teams by the time we get to the end of Acts chapter 15? Two. God doubled it. Now, could have God been just as effective if Paul and Barnabas would have stayed together? Absolutely, I believe that. So please don't use this as some sort of proof text that God's going to support you and your disagreement and we're going to go our way and do our thing because you have to remember that God wants unity first and foremost above anything. He wants His kids to get along. And God is going to use both of them, even though there's a separation over a sharp disagreement, He's going to use both of them to fulfill His purposes and His kingdom. Now, I think I've been pretty honest by telling you I wish I could stand before you and declare, but I can't, that I've handled every conflict wisely. There have been sharp disagreements in my life, much like Paul and Barnabas, which were never resolved. Perhaps you have stories of the same. But as I've studied this text, I'm hopeful that should I face any further sharp disagreements, and I hope there are none, but should I face any other sharp disagreements in my ministry or in my life, my prayer is that I might handle them wisely and for God's glory. And I hope that's what you're at today too. You can't change the past. You can't change how the other person is going to respond. But as far as it depends upon me, I'm going to fight for unity and peace. And that may mean to compromise where I can. And it may mean that you have to compromise where you can. Let's stand together this morning. Let's pray. And then we're going to have our time decision.